Hello, everyone. Um, I know that I am standing in between you and the reception, or technically, actually, you're all in between me and the reception. Um, and so I will keep this, of course, to eight minutes. Um, this is work that I'm presenting uh, in collaboration with Kevin Yu, Yan Lai Yang, Mindy Dai, GQ, Rebecca Tang, and Jenny Huang, who have been some fantastic undergraduate research apprentices who have been working with me on this project um, over the past about a year and a half. My name is Stuart Geiger. Uh, I am the staff ethnographer at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Um, that's a bit of a weird weird title. Um, often, I spend a lot of my time, I'm originally from the humanities and uh, critical theory and communication studies, and then got training in ethnography, which is sort of the method of anthropology. It was a very qualitative, unstructured sort of uh, work. Um, often, I go to humanities and interpretive social science conferences wearing cats, wearing uh, t-shirts with cats on them to talk about machine learning. Now, I'm at a computer science conference, and so I have to wear my humanities tweed uh, to represent. Um, and one of the things that um, I also have sort of some links to, uh, you know, contact if you want to get in touch, as well as the links to the uh, paper uh, up on archive, as well as a link to the slides. Um, and to summarize, this paper in four bullet points. Um, first off, many of the ethical issues that we discuss in machine learning applications can often be traced back to the quality of training data or the lack thereof. Um, I decided actually not to show a screenshot of some really problematic labels from ImageNet, which some of you might have sort of seen uh, concerns about in, the, in, in sort of previous months. But also the way that training data is labeled by humans often is what we call a form of structured content analysis, which has established best practices in the humanities and social sciences. Um, so the research question that we asked in this is how many papers in a particular application domain of machine learning, classifiers trained on tweets, um, report following these practices? And the answer is that it varies substantially, which shows the need for a lot more emphasis on uh, data labeling practices in, a, in machine learning education, um, evaluation, and regulation. So structured content analysis, sometimes called closed coding, is a well-established method that goes back for generations in the humanities and social sciences. It's actually interesting that I find myself like advocating and talking up this because I often do what's called unstructured or open coding that are based on very different principles and philosophies of knowledge. But um, you know, working, for example, in communication studies has extensively had armies of undergraduate researchers that go and sort of annotate what the content of the news is, for example. And so structured content analysis has many best practices. Um, and I should say this is the case if, if you have people who are making discrete judgments about a particular item. For example, labeling uh, tweets as hate speech, for example. So one textbook defines it as a systematic and replicable method where you define a coding scheme with procedures, definitions, and examples. You recruit and train multiple coders with this coding scheme. You have them independently code at least a portion of the same items. Um, and then you calculate the inner annotator agreement or, or innovator reliability. Then there's a defined process of reconciliation for disagreements. Sometimes it's just majority vote uh, without discussion or the ability for people to change their vote. Sometimes it's a more discussion-based process. And then you're also iterating on this because what you're looking for is often some kind of, uh, sort of unobservable theoretical construct, as we remember the tutorial from uh, yesterday, because you're also often trying to sort of track to see if what the coders are doing with the, with the pr procedure that you developed actually tracks what you're looking for. And often, you don't get it right the first time. So we looked at a data set of machine learning application papers trained on tweets. We chose this for a couple different reasons. I can talk about that later. In particular, I've done a lot of work on content moderation, so I knew a lot of these li this literature before. Um, we ended up sampling 135 from Archive, 29 from Scopus, which is a, a bibliometrics uh, database, kind of like Web of Science. Um, and it's written so. It and then I want to talk about our annotation, pro our annotation process, because it's really important to give the details about this. But nope, it's an eight-minute talk. No time for methods. It's really important to talk about the coding scheme, but nope, no time for methods. <laughs> Borderline cases, no, we have no time for methods. Eight minutes. I can't even give you the questions we ask. No time for methods. This is actually part of the problem, is that often reviewers, and you know, it's not the re individual researcher's fault, but we often don't give time because we need to talk about the results and the methods and the rigor go by the wayside. So we asked tw uh, 12 questions. This is a summary of sort of what they are, and I'll walk you through these in a bit. Um, the first thing we asked is, was this even an original, were they presenting an original machine classification task? Were they building their own classifier? Um, actually, about 80 said, this is basically how good was our keyword searching in our corpus for finding papers we were looking for. 87%. And so of those, then we said, how many uh, were getting their labels from human annotation, where uh, a human was making a discrete judgment about each item? Um, that was 65%. The other 35% were using machine-labeled um, or kind of semi-automated methods and other sort of ways. 
Um, then of those, um, we asked how many are using, we found about 33% were using external data sources. So someone, it was human annotation, but someone else from like a public data set, for example, um, ran the annotation process. 75% engaged in original human annotation. They ran their own process or they labeled the, data, the tweets themselves. And that adds up to over 100% because some people did both external and original. And then of those that did original human annotation, 76% specified the source, who the annotators were, um, although, it, and, and, uh, although, as I'll show, as I'll show in the next slide, a lot of that uh, was the, uh, sort of an implicit we labeled, uh, which we took to be the authors labeling it themselves. Um, only 43% gave definitions or instructions to annotators. Um, only 15% described annotator training details beyond instructions. This would be like interactive training or feedback, the ability to ask questions. Um, only 55% specified how many annotators looked at each item. Only 50% did multiple annotator overlap. Then of those, only 70% uh, 70 reported some sort of inner annotator agreement metric. 11% um, had the data set available publicly. Of those using crowd workers, 100% did some kind of pre-screening task, which is good. 0% um, reported crowd worker compensation, um, which is an issue for a lot of different reasons. If we break out also the, the source, we actually, the plurality of papers has kind of surprised us were the paper's authors themselves, but often that was like an implicit we labeled, um, and so we took that. Um, but then the next category was no information. We actually had far fewer crowd workers than we expected. We calculated an annotation information score, basically how many of these yeses did you sort of have. And it's interesting that it's kind of a, it's a, two, it's a bimodal distribution. It suggests there's two populations of papers and studies. We also kind of broke this out by publisher and corpus. Um, now, I, I suggest don't uh, overgeneralize from these results for various reasons, but it's interesting that ACM and ACL kind of tie for the top, the top of the pack. So with this, limitations, again, I caution against overgeneralizing this. Um, we have small sample sizes, particularly the, the ones we drew from archive. Archive is a representative source, but it's interesting to think what people who post art on archive are representative of. Papers forming class on a classification task on Twitter, also not representative, but it did span many different application domains and disciplines that people use Twitter for. We're working on an expanded study. We're looking across this, doing stratified random samples of a whole bunch of different domains, um, including health, uh, me health and medicine, and uh, environmental science. So human annotation in labeling is as important as it is difficult, and we need to make time and space for methods and messiness, particularly in reviewing and papers and page length. Also, issues about operationalization and construct validity play out in the design of human annotation processes. Um, think about the tutorial that many of you sort of went, uh, did yesterday that Abby Jacobs helped run. Um, these should be made explicit. For example, if you're having people label photos of, you know, of, of people from the social media profiles for gender, you're not, don't actually call, that's not actually gender. That's gender presentation according to a normative, probably cisgender presentation that Amazon Mechanical Turk workers are trying because they don't want to get their hits rejected by you as a researcher. It's important to think about what exactly we call the things that we label. And so this should be a core part of ML education, any structured transparency, documentation process, or regulation. So with that, I'm out of time, but I just want to thank uh, so the funders, the Morin Sloan Foundations, as well as Berkeley's UREP program, um, as well as, you know, I, a lot of the undergrads on this, um, on this uh, project are graduating and looking for jobs uh, or internships, so please get in touch, especially if you have things around data labeling, data quality. There aren't that many, actually, internships uh, available that are signaled in that space, which actually does affect what undergrads think of as important in the, in the industry. So thank you very much.